Hello, I am Pastor Matthew Verhoeg, and this is a video commentary of Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. So this is a rather straightforward story with a couple of interesting points as we go through Luke's gospel. We remember one of the big themes in Luke is the issue of wealth and the Christian. You almost get the idea that Theophilus, the the uh, I think the financial backer of Luke's project is a is a wealthy Christian, and one of the questions he has is how does a Christian deal with with wealth? And we get to see this so many times throughout Luke's uh, Luke's gospel, and we've just had the very memorable story of the rich young ruler and the camel through the needle's eye, but going all the way back to Mary's. Uh, Mary's, the Magnificat, Mary's uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Luke one fifty three. he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. We have the blessings and the woe, blessed are the poor, but woe to you who are rich and the, the foolish one, uh, Luke 12, 20, fool this night is required of you and the things you prepared whose will, will they be so is the one who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards god we have the weird parable of the unrighteous steward i make for yourselves me yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth make for yourself friends we have the rich man who who died and versus lazarus the the poor man who is with abraham and then you know, just before this, the rich young, the rich young ruler who sent away empty, and you come through Luke's gospel wondering, like, is there actually like a place for a rich person in the Christian community? And I think the pair, the the this story of Zacchaeus really functions for Luke as a an exemplar of what a wealthy Christian looks like. Zacchaeus again. Okay, so let's get to the text itself. Uh, and entering, he was passing through Jericho. Jericho is in a very important trading center. It sort of marks, it's, it's, it's an important town on the eastern edge of, of really the Roman Empire. Like you get, you're into Parthia if you go past here. And it was a chief place for collecting taxes, probably a lot of import taxes coming from the, the edge of the Roman Empire. And <coughs> oh. and verse 2, so he's passing through, so he, obviously this is Jesus, and behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and he was rich. So two important points, chief tax collector and he was rich. Tax uh, Chief tax collector here, this is a unique word. Uh, it, it means sort of like arch tax collector. And it is apeke, which is like the, the ruler, ruler tel, telones, ruler of the tax collector chief tax collector in the sense of one who controlled the activities of certain other tax collectors. And so this was someone in the bureaucracy, uh, a higher up, and, and a lot of these taxes were gathered by, they would take out contracts. And so he might be the guy who's, who's getting a contract from the Romans and then sending out the foot soldiers to actually do the tax collecting. I, I kind of imagine this. I don't know if this is too much imagination, but I imagine him kind of as a Don Corleone, where he's uh, kind of a mob boss, controlling these people, pulling the strings, making money. But anyways, he's very wealthy. And as we've seen before throughout the Gospels, tax collectors obviously very unpopular, not just because of you know collecting taxes, but they are sellouts to the Romans and they are pariahs of polite society. And yet he is a, a rich man. And so we get to see how does Jesus treat this wealthy pariah. Okay, so Zacchaeus, we also get a name here, which may be interesting. And, and 
Uh, there is a lot of early church history which mentions Zacchaeus as maybe a deacon in an early church, and he's probably a well-known person, which is the assumption when we get names in the Gospels. Verse 3, And he was seeking to see Jesus, but he was not able because of the crowd, for he was of small stature. Uh, he was seeking to see Jesus. And some people, uh, uh, and, and, and I think the idea is he was trying to see where Jesus was. You have this tight crowd and he's a short guy. And, you know, maybe the literary tropes of the, the short rich guy come into play here. But he can't see Jesus. He can't see where he is. And so he takes the, oh, maybe the important word here, seeking. And so he is seeking Jesus in this way. We don't know his motives yet, but at least he is seeking Jesus. And and this is going to have, actually, uh, seeking here, this is going to have a parallel at the end. Jesus comes to seek and save the lost. So, so he's seeking to see Jesus, but as we're going to find out, ironically, Jesus is seeking him. Verse 4, And running ahead before, he went up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And the he here is Jesus. They don't translate, like, tell you Jesus. They just say he and let context figure it out in the, in the Gospels. Your translation might translate this Jesus. And uh, the sycamore tree here is this kind of oakish tree. You can look it up on the internet and it's got low branches and it's easy to climb even for, you know, a short guy like Zacchaeus. So he runs up, goes into the tree, and this is, you know, what makes this a fun story. He goes up in the tree and as he, and this is Jesus, came to the place, Jesus, after looking up, said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down. For I must stay at your house today. I must stay at your house. And must here, it, it's uh, literally like it is necessary for me to stay at your house today. And usually in Luke, uh, the, the word day, uh, D, it's in Greek, day, uh, is used for something that is a defi divine necessity. So there's a necessity that Jesus come to Zacchaeus' house. And this must have been shocking, obviously. Like, how did Jesus know this? But Jesus, you know, he just knows things. And he goes and he seeks out Zacchaeus. So as Zacchaeus is looking for him, Jesus finds Zacchaeus. And uh, you can read whatever Calvinist uh, readings you want to read into that. I'm totally okay with that. Verse 6, and he quickly came down. So... Jesus says, hurry down. He quickly came down and received him. And this word received him isn't just like, uh, it, it has the implication of he received him into his house. And so we can picture he took him, brought him into his house. And then everything that happens after this is not on the street anymore. This is in Zacchaeus' house, probably a large house. He's a rich man. He has servants and he takes Jesus and probably his disciples in and he does this, and this is the key word, he does it joyfully. So he receives Jesus with joy. It's not an imposition for him. He's happy to bring Jesus into his house. And all those seeing this grumbled, grumbled, thinking back to like the Exodus, the Israelites grumbled against Moses, saying, he has gone to be the guest of a sinful man. And I think we can can take with uh, with what comes next. We we can take with pretty certainty. Like Zacchaeus was a sinful man. Like he wasn't just a an honest, upright tax collector, but he did some shady stuff, which is going to be hinted at as we go as we go on. Verse eight. And Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus stood up. And said. To the Lord, behold, half my half of my things, Lord, I give to the poor, and if anyone I have defrauded, I will give them fourfold. 
So this is half, and not just half of his his cash, like half of all that he has, he's going to give to the poor, which is an amazing sum. Now we compare this to the rich young ruler. Jesus asked to give all to the poor, and he doesn't give any. Now this person, Jesus doesn't ask him anything other than hospitality, and he gets up and he gives away half of his things. Now this is Again, as we go through Luke's gospel, we think of this as the exemplar of the rich person following God. He gives half of his things away. Now, he calls him Lord here, which isn't strictly a divine title, but has implications that I think in Luke, we generally, when someone is treating Jesus as he ought to be treated as the Messiah, maybe divine Messiah, uh, they, they call him Lord. And here Zacchaeus is calling him Lord. And then the second part is if if anyone I have defrauded, and in English we might read this if as you know maybe I have maybe I haven't, but it's actually a, a grammatical construction that tells us like yes, there are certain people I have defrauded, and for those people I'm going to make restitution. Now I haven't defrauded everybody. Not everybody I've defrauded, but some, the ones that I have defrauded, if I have, I will make restitution. Now, there's two ways to make restitution in the, in the Bible. One is in kind of the, the priestly law. If you were to have defrauded someone, you would have to pay them back plus one-fifth, so plus 20%, and that was, that was a rule. But if you s just stole something through like stealing an ox or sheep and so so on the one hand it like defraud if it's sort of you know it's a kind of cheaty thing that a lot of people do maybe like you know use car salesmen you know you mark up a price a bit um and the other one if you steal an ox or sheep and you see this uh exodus 22 so this is this is the the rule i'll show it out to you uh if a man steals an ox or sheep and he kills it or sells it he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep and now uh Zacchaeus is going to make restitution like he like was a highway robber and he will give fourfold so he goes above and beyond what is strictly necessary but he follows like the strictest observance of the law in uh in making restitution Now, Jesus, in response to this, says, Today, salvation to this house has come. So basically, you know, he is saying, you know, this person who was once a, a sinner and did bad things has become saved. And, and we have this curious, for this man, for this man is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And we have, uh, going back to the people, and, and you feel like this is addressing the grumblers. You know, this is a sinful man. And Jesus is saying, this isn't just a sinful man, but a son of Abraham. Someone that I came to seek and to save those who were lost. And we get to see Jesus' heart here. He is a... He is coming to save this person who isn't poor, but is a social outcast, who is a truly a, a sinner. And so in response to the people who say, you know, he's gone to the house of a sinner, Jesus says, yes, exactly. That's what I've gone to do. I've come to seek out these sinners and not just seek them, but to see that they are, that they are saved. That is, that they are in right relationship with with me. Um, as we see the Luke, and we, we can see kind of this is going to be Calvin's quote of the day, it's like what uh, we should take from this. And that is Zacchaeus has not laid on other, other, has not laid others under obligation by his example to strip themselves of the half of their goods. And so I think Calvin's right here saying that, you know, we shouldn't take this as, as a rule. But we've only to observe the rule which the Lord prescribes, that we dedicate ourselves and all that we have to holy and lawful purposes. Now, I think this is right, but as we read through Luke, we 
really should take the example seriously. And if you're if you're preaching this, sharing this, if you're you're reading this, you need to take Zacchaeus's example seriously of giving half of what he has away. Because this is the example of the salvation of a rich person in Luke's gospel. Now, people are called to do all things. And I think Calvin's right. All are called to dedicate what they have to the Lord's business. But Zacchaeus's example should be held up as, as the scriptural way in Jesus' ministry for a rich person to find salvation. All right, this is the story of Zacchaeus, and I hope you've learned a bit from the text. Thanks.